journalists at the press briefing. The next day, on Wednesday, the White House spokesperson made an equally stunning statement. Asked about Pierre Cook, she asserted U.S. neutrality between the Kurds and the Iraqis, and then said, quote, we'd like for them, that is the Kurds and the Iraqis, to be focused on helping continue in the fights against ISIS in Iran. We reported that to a reveal in our WhatsApp group, and we got back, what? Are you sure? Okay, it is crazy. And that is a fundamental contradiction in this U.S. strategy towards what is going on now between Baghdad and Erbil. Mike Pregent, we'll make comments later, Mike worked on the question of Iranian influence in the Iraqi security forces for a series of U.S. generals, Atreus, Odierno, and McMaster, says that a body is a weak figure. He is there only as long as the Iranians tolerate him, and I agree. Once ISIS is defeated, it's likely the Iranians will say, bye-bye, Mr. Abadi. Okay? And if you look at it, step back and look at it from a big picture perspective. The man in charge of Iran's policy towards Iraq is Qasem Soleimani. The man in charge in Washington is Brett McGurk. Between Qasem Soleimani and Brett McGurk, who is likely to win? The KRG, this is Bayan Khan has, has done, is pointing out, you're making a mistake, America. I pointed it out. We could be called uh, parties with, with a stake in the outcome of this day, debate. However, there is one important party that has no vested interest in one side or the other, but is very informed and very concerned about Iran, and that is Israel. The Israeli Prime Minister is now making calls to various world leaders, telling them, hey, you gotta arm the Kurds, give them the means to defend themselves. So that is one crazy point, a basic contradiction in the so-called strategy that the US has towards Iran. Refusal to recognize Iran's role in the assault on Kirkuk and the belief that supporting Iraq will contain another Iraq, will contain Iran. Another crazy point in the so-called strategy is to turn a blind eye to Iranian orchestrated aggression and think you can control it. One has to be very arrogant about U.S. power and influence to think such a thing. We don't know what Iran's plans and intentions are or where this will end up. Will they stop only in, this, in Kirkuk in the disputed areas or will they try to go further? Yesterday, there was a, an attack on, on uh, Pidri and the Kurdistan Regional Security Council issued a statement saying that the objective was Kushtapa. Kushtapa is in Erbil province. It is on the road between Kirkuk and Erbil, and it suggests an Iranian intent that goes beyond the disputed areas. Today, people were fleeing Tok Tok in Sulaimania province. Tok Tok is where many of the anti-Iranian Kurdish parties are located. An intelligent and comprehensive policy aimed at Tehran would be to support the Iranian opponents of the Tehran regime, not let the Iranians run over them and capture their headquarters. Again, a basic contradiction. Because the US position is incoherent, Criticism of it within Washington is growing. There are allies. Zalmay Khalilzad, former U.S. ambassador to Iraq, has called on the United States to disable the U.S. tanks that are in the possession of the Hosh al Shabi. The U.S. has the means to do so remotely. And I'd suggest something even more. Tell those people to stop, particularly the Hosh al Shabi and the Iranian forces, and if not, we will bomb you because we have the air assets already in the theater to do that. 
And for an administration that wants to be tough on Iran, I can think of no better action to take. This is not the first time that the United States policy towards on this issue can be charitably, charitably described as cockamamie. I remember 20, roughly 26 years ago, in March of 1991, Bush 41 had called a ceasefire to the war with Saddam at the end of February. He had also called on the Iraqi military and the Iraqi people to overthrow the dictator Saddam Hussein. That did not happen before the end of February when Bush unilaterally called a ceasefire to the astonishment of the entire Middle East, but it occurred afterwards, in March. Uprising began in the South and the North. The United States stood by and watched. Hey, if you want to overthrow Saddam, why don't you help those people? That didn't happen. And gradually Saddam was was recovering territory that was still, um, it, it was undecided, when at the end of March, on March 26th, Iraq experts who had the president's ear, that the coup, they had expected a coup in Baghdad. They said the reason this coup had to occur is because um, of the uprising. So you let Saddam suppress the uprising, and then the coup will occur because these officers are scared of the people. So that's what Bush did. The White House announced that um, it clarified an ambiguity. The United, States, the United States would not shoot down Iraqi helicopters, which was a green light for Saddam to crush the uprising. We're not going to shoot down your helicopters. You thought we might. No, we're not going to do that. And Bush himself left for vacation in Florida. The result was something that I'm sure people you're old enough, remember well. Kurdish exodus to the frontiers of Turkey and Iran, tens of thousands of people in the mountains, people, the weak and vulnerable dying, and at that point, intense pressure was put on the Bush administration by a number of people. You must do something about this. Those people include the president of Turkey, and the Bush policy changed. That's when Operation Divide Comfort began. So it is possible to change these policies. The United States has been cockamamie before. It's cockamamie now. I know people are upset, disappointed, very unhappy and depressed. But it's important, as Bayan Khan said, that everyone you know, do their share, whatever problems people may have here, whatever depression and sadness they feel, is nothing compared to the Peshmerga on the front lines. And I can only underscore the importance of what you said, that everyone do what they can to support them. Thank you. Allah, thank you, Lori Khan. Thank you, Dr. Milroy. Uh, we got a new step there, you know, about the Abrams tanks. I don't know if you picked it up. When I, I saw that, I was amazed. Uh, I, I just want to mention, you know, a recollection uh, that I have of being in the State Department in 2005. I remember, uh, because I was uh, working with the spokesman in the Public Affairs Department, we looked at the talking points every day. And I remember this talking point. I could reveal it now because it's not really secret. And every single day for weeks and months, the first talking point was our strategy is working. This is 2005. Our strategy is working. We are standing up a democratically elected government in Iraq, which is gaining the support of the Iraqi people. And after a couple of months, I was looking at my colleagues sitting next to me and saying, uh, you know, Calvin. This is Orwellian. Our strategy is not working. <laughs> We're losing the war. I mean, the military casualties were enormous. The civilian casualties were worse. Uh, I could, we couldn't see the actual evidence of this. And when I, yesterday, I think, when our State Department uh, spokesman said that, uh, and, and our coalition spokesman said that they had no knowledge of Iranian troops being in Kirkuk, on, on Monday, I was, I, it took me back to 2005. Uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce 
Uh, our next speaker, uh, Mr. David uh, Tafuri. Uh, David is a partner with the uh, law firm of Dettons here in Washington, D.C. He was in Baghdad at the same time as myself. Uh, from 2006 to 2007, David served as the U.S. State Department's rule of law coordinator for Iraq at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. And in that position, he works directly with the Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. System. That's also served on the board of directors of USA for U N H C R, which supports the United States United Nations Refugee Agency. So we're going to hear from David on best prospects uh, for the Korean the uh, Kurdish regional government uh, in the present situation. Baba Dr. Morroy Muhim, I have a Jedi. Live Nard, that? You buy Nard, but I'm not sure. That's what Shia militias and Iraqi army 
were not as strong as they are now. But of course, had the Kurds elected to have a ethnic referendum then, the U.S. government and the coalition would have come down even harder on them for, in their um, view, interfering with the effort to fight ISIS. This was a good time to have the referendum. Maybe not the best time, but there was never going to be a very good time. And so I think we have to move forward uh, and the U.S. government should be moving forward in view of the fact that the referendum did happen. Um, and there are sort of four areas, four sort of key points that I think that we all, who support the referendum, who support the future of the Kurds in Iraq, and who would like to see the U.S. government to have a more reasonable policy with respect to the Kurdistan region, that we should be removed. Uh, first of all, um, we should be talking about Article 140 and the failure for there to be an implementation of Article 140 of the Constitution. We all know that Article 140 set forth the agreed to process for the future of, of, of Kirkuk and the other disputed territories. As recently as in July, Governor Kareem of the Kirkuk province asked Baghdad to implement Article 140, and Baghdad refused. Article 140 calls for a referendum in Kirkuk and the other disputed territories so the people can decide upon their future. What is the U.S. policy with respect to the failure of the implementation of Article 140, and why doesn't the U.S. government ever talk about Article 140 now? And the fact that they are not talking about it is exactly why we should be talking about it. And if, if, and for those who claim that Iraq has acted, Iraq and the Shia militias have acted legally, claiming that they have acted legally under the Constitution, what about the fact that it's Baghdad that refused it to implement Article 140? And I think we really need to push on this principle as hard as we can. No matter what happens in Kirkuk, there is a legal way to resolve the future of Kirkuk. It is Article 140. There should be immediate implementation of Article 140, and the U.S. government should support that wholeheartedly. One of the things that Iraq claims is a reason why they can't implement Article 140 is because they can't, they haven't had a census, which the Constitution also calls for. Well, why haven't they had a census? Is it because Iraq can't maintain a census? It can't actually organize a census? It organizes elections. It does, uh, it has programs like the subsidy program that reach people all over Iraq, why can't it conduct a census? Perhaps it's because it doesn't want to see the results of the census, because the results of the census might not support the Baghdad view on the population of Iraq. These are things that I think we really need to be pushing for right now. Now, another thing that I think is important to know is that the Kurdistan region itself needs to have a constitution. And the constitutional process for the Kurdistan region is you do, you do you do that you that I really think Kurdistan regional government leaders should be talking more about is their own constitutional process. The constitution for the region is both the way forward with respect to uh, resolving some of the internal disputes within the Kurdistan region and projecting outwardly to the U.S. and to the coalition and to the rest of the world that the Kurdistan region is ready to be a sovereign country, which is the principle that led it to, to hold a referendum in the first place. And so I, I hope we will talk more about the, the Kurdistan regional, uh, uh, region's process for having a constitution. I hope that out of this current crisis that we now face, the constitutional process for the Kurdistan region will be viewed as even more important than it was before, and that we can talk about a constitutional process in the Kurdistan region as a way to show that the Kurdistan region supports the rule of law and will have a future democracy governed by a constitution. The constitution should also address Kirkuk and the disputed territories. Third, uh, as Lori talked a lot about, and as we, uh, my colleague and friend uh, Michael Bujan will also talk about, we need to talk more about the involvement in, of Iran in the, uh, the, the latest operations 
they proclaimed the support that the Iranian government is providing to the militias, and the the fact uh, the, the contradictions in U.S. policy that President Trump last week, last Friday, gave one of the toughest speeches any president has given in a long time with respect to Iraq, announced that he is sanctioning the Revolutionary Guard, and then four or five days later looked the other way as the Revolutionary Guard and the Iranian government supported a, a, a military attack on an otherwise peaceful region. Um, and I would also note that I was in uh, Kurdistan uh, three weeks ago. I was there for the referendum, as many of you were as well. Um, I see several people who were there with me. Um, I also visited uh, Kirkuk uh, a couple of days after the referendum. And as, as all of us know, Kirkuk has been a very peaceful uh, province. It is a marked contrast to what Kirkuk was like when Douglas and I, for instance, were in Iraq. Uh, when I was in Iraq in 2006 and 2007, Kirkuk was one of the most violent places in Iraq. The U.S. could not conduct any operations without uh, coming under attack. Uh, we built a courthouse in Kirkuk for about 20 million U.S. dollars, and the week after we finished the building the courthouse has been blown up by insurgents. That hasn't been happening in Kirkuk. And, and we don't talk enough about that. When I was there three weeks ago, they had just had a peaceful, a completely peaceful referendum throughout the, the province without any problems. So what was it that necessitated the, the operation by the Iraqi army and the Shia militias to go into a province that has actually been completely peaceful for the last few years and that, by the way, wasn't peaceful when it was governed by Iraq. That's something that I don't think we talk about enough, and I think we really need to talk about that more. Um, and then finally, I think the most important thing that we need to be pushing the U.S. government and U.S. policymakers to do is to pressure Baghdad to come to the table with the Kurdistan region and reach a peaceful resolution with respect to the disputed territories and a horizon for the Kurdistan region to become independent. That needs to be negotiated peacefully, and the only way Baghdad will come to the table is if, it, if, it, is if it's on the other end of a lot of pressure from the U.S. government. That's what the U.S. government should have been doing in the lead-up to the referendum and in the days after the referendum, rather than continuing to uh, lecture the Kurdistan region that it shouldn't have had a referendum. Had the U.S. pushed for that, and had that been the narrative from the U.S., we might not be in this position. And Amin Shirabadi and the other Iraqi leaders in Baghdad might have been less inclined to engage in military action in Kirkuk, more inclined to go to the table, especially if the U.S. put the full leverage of the U.S. government and put all of the support and aid it provides to Iraq on the line if Baghdad did go to the table for the Kurds. We should be hopeful that that will happen. These are going to be tough times for the next few months, maybe for the next few years, but I believe that the level of support and commitment in America, the level of great feeling among our U.S. service members who served in Iraq towards the Kurds will ultimately win out and cause those policymakers in the U.S. government who decide policies like this to force Baghdad to come to the table, and that's in my view, what we should be pushing for. Thank you all. Thank you, David. That's the, uh, that's the congressional agenda uh, right there. Uh, it's, it's heartening to say that some congressmen are stepping up to the plate. Yesterday, uh, Congressman Marsha Blackburn, uh, chairman of the uh, Kurdish uh, caucus in the Congress, also Jared Polis, uh, Denver, and uh, also uh, Representative Abrahams from uh, Louisiana and others are, are speaking out. I think uh, they would have spoken up earlier if the Congress was uh, not in session. Uh, it's, it's, it's really mystifying. It's mind-boggling to me what our State Department is doing. We have yet what their reasoning is. 
But the question before us now is, how can Kurdistan uh, take, make use of its opportunities as, uh, as uh, Madam Bayan has pointed out in her earlier session, not all is lost. We heard in the last session, there are still economic opportunities that allow Kurdistan to uh, leverage its uh, economic assets. So I'd like to give the floor now to uh, Madam uh, uh, Bayan Rahman. Thank you very much, uh, Douglas. Um, some of you have come in late, or I've come this afternoon, I should say. I spoke earlier, I addressed the issue of the referendum and what has happened already since the referendum. I'm not going to address those issues again. I'm saying this in case you're wondering, is she from another planet that she's not talking about Kirkuk? I talked about it earlier. So, the title of this session is The Future of Kurdistan Region. And setting aside everything that I said earlier about uh, what's been happening before, during, and after the referendum, and whatever happens with regards to Iraqi Kurdistan, whether we remain part of Iraq for a foreseeable future, whether we have confederation, whether we have outright independence, there are some things that we need to put right, we need to put our house in order. And this is what I'd like to focus on. I'll try to keep my remarks brief because uh, the KNC very generously gave me a lot of time earlier to speak. So I've made a list and I'll try to go through it very quickly. So this list is a, a list of suggestions on how to strengthen our economy and our society. Um, First, we need to continue with the economic reforms and the diversification that we've embarked on. The panel earlier, I think, had a great discussion on the ills of Kurdistan's economy and the reforms that have already begun and the possible future that we could have for having an economy that will still rely on oil and gas and resources, but will be able to use it in such a way that it strengthens the entire economy and we heard about an example of Chile, which is also very reliant on copper as its main resource, but how they have managed to uh, control and manage that wealth. So I think we need to make sure that the commitment to economic reform and diversification continues. We also need to continue to build and strengthen our institutions. And these are governmental and non-governmental. So the KRG itself needs to be strengthened our parliament needs to be strengthened, but also non-governmental institutions. Uh, for example, I don't know, I think we have an integrity commission. We need organizations like that to, to have more teeth and to be able to act more independently and so on. We need to strengthen the judiciary. So these are in the institutions that we need to build. If you look at what's happening in the United States, I don't want to enter into the debate of what happened with Russia? Did they have contact with the Trump administration? I'm uh, sorry, the Trump campaign or not? That is for others to decide. But the example I want to use is that you have the FBI, you have the judiciary questioning the president. That shows you the strength of the institutions of the United States. Whether they're right or wrong, ultimately what they will find is something else but it shows you the strength of the judiciary, the, the strength of the institutions and the systems in the United States. Then we need to strengthen our democracy, and part of that is transparency and accountability. Somebody asked a question earlier about accountability, and I will try to address that later in the Q&A. But we definitely need to strengthen and build those processes and institutions so that the public have much more faith in their representatives, in government decisions, and in being able to hold people to account. We also need to do much more uh, on the minorities, ethnic and religious minorities. I don't think that we can sit comfortably and say, well, the minorities have 11 seats in our parliament, and they have this or they have that. Society evolves. If you look at American society, 
At one time, if you were black, you had to sit at the back of the bus. At one time, if you were black, you couldn't drink water from the same fountain, water fountain, as a white person. Those were the rights that the black people were fighting for back then. Today, they're fighting for something else. Today, they're kneeling when the national anthem is played at uh, football games. What I'm trying to illustrate is that society evolves. The demands of people, the demands of women, the demands of youth, the demands of the Yazidis, the Christians, others, Turkmen, they evolve. And we, as a KRG and as a society, should evolve with that. We should accept that the Christians, Yazidis, Shabaks, Kakes, Turkmen, Arabs in Kurdistan, they want more rights, they want stronger representation, they want more protection. We should accept that and take that on board. And if we want a secular, respectful society that empowers everyone, we need to make sure that that is embedded in our society. And I would include in that the pursuit of justice and accountability for the genocide that's happened. One of the missing ingredients in Iraq has been the lack of accountability for genocide. For genocide. Who was really held accountable for Anfal? I don't think anyone feels satisfied by the Iraq High Tribunal. They did some things, but they didn't do enough. And so we as the KRG, we ought to do much, much more in pursuing justice and accountability for the genocide that is still unfolding. We also need to continue with the reforms of the Peshmerga. We have signed uh, an MOU with the United States, Britain, and Germany on reforming the Peshmerga so that it is much more of a national unified army and has uh, more of the classic features of a regular army. The Peshmerga is still very heavy on the front end, the front line. That is how guerrilla operations work. If you look at the United States military, the bulk of it is the equipment, is the training, is the logistics, and the front line is smaller. Our Peshmerga is the other way around because we have the legacy of the guerrilla movement. Arguably, if our Peshmerga were unified, what happened in Kirkuk would not have happened because they would have all dealt with the commander-in-chief. They would not have made their own unilateral decisions. So reform and unification of the Peshmerga has to be on our agenda. Finally, and I'm sure the list could go on forever, but for the sake of time, uh, my final point is better communications. The KRG needs to have better communications with our own people. And I would include the diaspora in that. Those of us who live or work abroad or grew up abroad like myself. I'm British, I have British citizenship, I'm very proud of that. I'm honored to be working here in the United States. But I am also Kurdish. I want to know what my government in Kurdistan is doing. I want to know what my members of parliament are doing. I want to know who they are. I don't know that much information about the members of parliament who supposedly represent me or other constituents. I want to know more about all of the institutions in Kurdistan. Better communications with the Kurdish population or the population in Kurdistan, with the diaspora, is I'm afraid, one of our weaknesses. So this is my own presentation. I'm not presenting a KDP view, a KRG view. This is Bayan speaking to you. These are my recommendations for us as a society, as a government. And I think that we are, enough of us are committed to this, that we should be able to engage in this properly and succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Bayan. I should have mentioned that Madam Bayan Rahman is the spokesperson for, from the, for the Kurdish regional government to the United States. So, uh, should we do... Yeah, just uh, to Mr. Bregent, who was, uh, has been a translator and an aide to General David Petraeus, General Ardurno, who was recently in Iraq. Some investigation and reporting for the Hudson Institute. So, Michael Bridget, 
He is the best.
can't give a speech, just like, just like David said, can't give a speech on Friday that says your mom is the enemy, and then on Sunday take a knee on a rock and take a knee on a current step. Our target audience is not Congress, it's not the Secretary of State, it's not the Defense Minister. Our target audience is President Trump. President Trump, I don't think he knows what a bad mistake he made by not taking sides. You don't take sides against an ally, you take sides. You take sides against the aggressors. In this case, the aggressors are wrong. And people say, well, you're too close to this, you served in the Peshmerga, you were an intelligence officer in Iraq. Yeah, I'm close to it. People say you don't have skin in the game because you're not Iraqi. I've been in Iraq since digital school. I was a sergeant that um, registered to a month ago. I have skin in the game. I served with the Iraqis who have died supporting American operations against Al-Qaeda. I know Americans that served in Peshmerga who have died by ISIS. I visited wounded Peshmerga in Accra who served with special operations when they went after ISIS on high volume targets. We all have skin in the game. And there's no bigger ally than our, than our Kurdish friends. I'm not talking about Kurdish political parties. I'm talking about the Kurds. There's not one Kurd that's killed in America since we've been that's important. As, as we look at government institutions, we look at political parties by their position. Nothing says pay attention louder than watching America deny the war of Iranian militias directed by Hassan Soleimani using American equipment to attack the Kurdish civilians. Just real quick to take this out of party. The biggest pushback against the Hashim al came from Shia Kurds in Haiti. That's big. It wasn't Peshmerga that fought back against Hashem Shah in the Middle East. It was Shia Kurds in Haiti that actually made a made myth of kinmen for some of, the, some of the resistance we've seen. Now, I know I'm going long ago. This is the most absurd comment coming out of the Department of Defense and State. Counterterrorism forces are moving into Kurdish held areas to install war. Counterterrorism forces are supposed to be used against terrorists. Al Qaeda and ISIS, Peshmerga have never been, have never fallen in that category uh, with America, but we're, we're kind of in danger of having that happen in the next decade if we don't do something about this now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Sorry. So sorry. Uh, okay, we have we have a little bit of time for uh, questions. Okay, who's got the mic? That gentleman. Thank you. It's, it's a great discussion. I really appreciate Michael's comment because uh, my question to all panel is about this discrepancy between the White House and the State Department. And I feel that the diplomatic miscalculation has been a staple in the era of Donald Trump. And that is seen in the Qatar crisis, uh, I think. And it's a very similar situation happening. And I felt I, that is a question. That's my feeling, and I'm asking you, as uh, those who are, uh, of course, knowing the State Department very well. Um, my feeling is that um, certain, uh, I think, but let me put it in this way, President Barzani felt that there is a green light uh, from some folks close to um, White House instead of the State Department. So it was not necessarily um, a miscalculation on the President Barzani side, but it was also a miscommunication. So the blame is also uh, on the um, U.S. administration. So uh, maybe not only my work at uh, the State Department, but also we, we need to, I think, think about this discrepancy uh, and disrespect to the State Department and, and these miscalculations. And I'm just hoping that uh, this miscommunication will not repeat with some other cases after Qatar 
and Kurdistan, hopefully North Korea and Iran would not get misreading of Washington because of this uh, discrepancy. So what is your feeling about it? Hear me okay? All right, so this communication has actually been uh, from, the, from, the, from those in Iraq. And here's the official DOD and DOS positions. The only official news coming out of Iraq would be that given to our Department of State Defense by the government of Iraq and in Baghdad. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have DOD advisors observing what's going on in these areas. Uh, it, DOD admitted that, said we, we can't verify. Kurdish side of this. We can only verify, not verify, we can only go with what we're given from the government of Iraq. That's an issue. Um, I recently came back from, from Mosul. I was able to get in a taxi and go with a couple of Peshmerga friends that I had. And we were able to drive into Mosul and places and we went to Iraqi checkpoints without even being asked who we were. We had more trouble getting through the Australian checkpoints. But when I went back and told people about Actually, got approached by state saying, Hey, what's going on with you? We have no idea. We don't need to get out there. Do you think, Hey, what's going on? We don't need to get out there. And I said, Yeah, kill me. <laughs> I'm going as a, a researcher from the Hudson Institute. I'm getting out there and talking to people. I'm going to refugee camps and talking to people. I'm going to uh, Mosul and stopping military drills on the, on the ground and saying, Hey, what do you think about all this? And one of the biggest problems is the information coming out of, coming back to, DOD, DOS, and the White House is, is essentially coming from the presidential envoy to the United States, Brendan Kirk. And I just, you know, I, I have not, I've known him since 2007, and I don't understand how he got to this position, and I don't like that he was meeting with the UN Secretary General um, while Kurdistan was being invaded by Qasas Hawaii forces and denying that they were doing it from where he was. He's a likable guy. Uh, most, most people that I know that work for Custom Solomonia are likable guy. I'm not talking about McGurk, I'm talking about Iraq. Excuse me, I don't know what saying that. But the president doesn't know what uh, And this administration is notorious for not seizing momentum. You do 59 cruise missiles in Syria, and then you don't follow up. But there's a schism there to be, to be exploited between Putin, Tehran, because Putin was able to protect against 59 cruise missiles. It didn't. There's another, I can mention the cover instance, that could have been, there was a momentum there. If you say that Hunter is involved in supporting al Qaeda and ISIS, it shines a light on the other countries that are supporting al Qaeda and ISIS. There's an opportunity for momentum, momentum lost. But I've never seen momentum lost as quickly as we saw Friday when you give a speech against the IRGC, designated, specifically designated. Custom Soleimani, RGC, for this reason, um, destabilizing countries in the Middle East and supporting their proxies in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. And, and with the, the key pillar, the first thing that the National Security Council told us when we went in for the brief prior to them releasing this information is the number one thing we want to do is neutralize IRGC destabilizing activities throughout the Middle East. So on Friday, you give a speech, and on Sunday, you've already lost the battle. But there's time to catch up. you got to do one thing. If Turkey can have a red line in Iraq, if Russia can have a red line in Iraq, and if Iran can have a red line in Iraq, the United States sure as hell should be able to have a red line in Iraq. Thank you, Mike. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lillay, thank you. I just discussed with Mike, uh, Mike Moore, I met some of, of, of this room, like the weathering uh, or the, uh, the, what's not in Washington DC right now, the, like uh, people are saying that the minorities, Christians, Yazidis, and others are more safe in the Hajj and Shah. And this is what causes the problem. This will say, okay, then if we drive Hajj al-Shabi 
out of the uh, like disappeared areas, and if you bring Peshmerga uh, back, then the, the other the other minority side will, will have a problem. So we need to change narrative in Washington D.C. here. How so? If David can can tell us how how can we approach this problem? Change the uh, State Department uh, or Congress or others that it's not true that if Haji Shahi takes over. Areas, those territories, that means we are more safe in those areas. Thank you. Well, it's a, a really good question and, um, and a really good point. And um, I think most people in this room know those things. I think the problem is there's just a deficit of good information here in the U.S. about what's happening in the Kurdistan region and in Iraq. And the, the latest development um, is sort of those who are not Iraq experts, it really sort of muddies the, the water because, um, they, you know, if you were following Iraq not that closely, you knew the main thing that the U.S. was trying to do was fight ISIS, and the Kurds were a great partner in fighting ISIS, and the Iraqi army was a good partner in fighting ISIS, and now all of a sudden, the Iraqi army and the Kurds, um, and, you know, are in disagreement. The Iraqi army has gone into Kirkuk. If you don't follow Iraq closely, you're not really sure what the status of Kirkuk is. We have to simplify things, and we have to use good examples to demonstrate to our leaders here in the U.S., to policymakers here in the U.S., to members of Congress, and to staff how closely affiliated the uh, Shia militias who've gone into Kirkuk and, and are going into the other areas and have recently been cleared of ISIS are to Iran and how problematic that is going to be for the future security of those areas. And, and that the U.S. is on the verge of making the same mistake all over again. And, and the last mistake was supporting Prime Minister Maliki as he carried out an, an agenda that uh, strengthened the central government, called the central government not to share resources and share power with the minorities in Iraq, and particularly excluded the Sunni communities in Iraq, delegitimized the Sunni communities in Iraq, and that is what led to ISIS. And so we are on the we have to convince our policymakers that by looking the other way, as Shia militias go into these uh, areas, who are not, as you say, they're not going to be able to protect these areas. They're not going to secure these areas. They're not going to treat the local people in those areas areas well and fairly. And then we're going to create the same situation, create the type of vacuum, the type of unhappiness that led to ISIS in India. Thank you. Could I just, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the face of it, the notion that the Hashd al Shabi would be more, would be better protectors of Christians and other minorities than the Peshmerga is, it is preposterous. Look at how they have, have been treated in parts of Iraq controlled by the Shia. Many such minorities have fled to the Kurdistan region because they are treated equitably there. They weren't in Baghdad. But if you just think of what it means to be a religious extremist, Islamic, Christian, whatever, by the very nature of being so ideologically committed to the righteousness of your own religion, you are apt to persecute others who don't share it. It's not a, it's not a, a plausible uh, understanding of the situation. Yeah. Mike, you want to say something? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, the Hashim al-Shabi are also very smart. And you'll see this on Department of State websites where they are actually will embrace a Christian, or embrace a priest, and then show Hashim al-Shabi putting a cross back on the church. This is meant to send a message that we're not a sectarian force, we love everybody. That is a photo op. And we have to be able to counter that narrative with the facts on the ground. Uh, Abu Israel hugging a Christian does not mean the hospital shall be like Christians. It's basically a, we are everywhere and look like just subjugated. And that's what this means. Lloyd, I, I just, just want to say that we have a big Christian minority of Syrian Christians, Chaldean Christians in Detroit and Wayne County, but folks here from Michigan. They have access to the Detroit Free Press. This would be a wonderful opportunity to make a public statement to a press release. Cool. What other questions? Uh, 
Sunnis is obviously a CIA guy. 
So he called me. And he said, um, hey, uh, yeah, I killed Sunnis, but I was in Sunni neighborhoods. Who else am I supposed to kill? And he used an LA Times article citing a, a detective who was under uh, investigation on the internal affairs for arresting too many African Americans in LA. And the detective took the investigator to his beat, and it was at once. So it kind of made sense that, of course, I'm arresting a lot of African Americans because. You know, this is where I patrolled in. <laughs> General Mehdi al Gawari used that defense. He was the leader of the World Brigade. He could not get a position in the government while Petraeus was there and Rodriguez was there because of his sectarian cleansing in Baghdad neighborhoods and the atrocities that he directed. He actually described one to me. I won't do that here because, of course, the guy he was doing this to was a terrorist. Um, the, uh, the main issue with the federal police is, it sounds good, right? Federal police and the Ministry of Interior are not Hashem Shabi, but the biggest thing that you could do to educate the U.S. media is to, is to do something about all of the flags flying for counterterrorism vehicles and federal police vehicles, because they are sectarian in the words they're saying, but you should never have a modern flag flying from an M1A tank a Qatar Hezbollah flag fiber from an M1 Abrams tank. And even Fox News will say today, Iraqi forces liberated a town against ISIS, and it's, a, it's, it's Hashem Shabi. And here, the thing about the federal police is their border control, again, their director is Qasem al Raji, imprisoned by American forces for killing Americans, tied to Honor Corps. He's actually in his profile, and this is as a Bonner and they are predominantly Shia, 95% Shia, but they always say, look, we have a Christian. Look, we have a Sunni, therefore we're not sectarian. It doesn't matter. If your command and control is sectarian and you join that unit, you become a sectarian tool. Uh, counterterrorism service, real quick on the counterterrorism service. The ISOF is what we call them when we were there. We built the ISOF in 2007. The majority of the ISOF was Kurdish. Not like you brought it from out from under... Uh, Abu Qadr al Mufridji's command in the MOD under his office of the commander in chief. He, he purged the Kurds, the effective Peshmerga from this organization, even fired the Kurdish commander, and then filled it with loyalists. They were so bad they brought the Kurdish commander back to, to be in charge of it. The ISOP is now called the Golden Division. It's listed as though it falls under the MOD. It does not. It falls under the Prime Minister's office, and it's used to punish both political operatives. And, uh, and, uh, and second class citizens like cities and Kurds. And I would just go to James Gordon Reeves research on this at ABC News, and you'll literally see Federal Police, Counterterrorism Service, and Hashim al-Shabi torturing a Sunni male, calling him an ISIS fighter or a collaborator. And it's not the Counterterrorism Service guys that are doing it. It's not the federal police necessarily that are doing it, but it is the clearly marked uh, IRGC proxy, whether it's uh, Kitab Imam Ali, AAH, or Kitab Islam, that's doing it while these federal forces are watching, not stopping it, watching it, taking selfies with it, photographing it. I, I, when, when, I, when I worked with the Iraqi army, there were Sunni companies and brigades, uh, divisions. Kurdish companies, battalions, brigades, and divisions. There are no more Sunni battalions, divisions, Kurdish battalions, Kurdish divisions are in Iraqi security forces. It is a Shia force. It's primarily built from the Shia areas, and the forces used in Mosul were, you know, I talked to people that helped build the 15th Iraqi Army Division. They said they're all from Saudi Arabia. And they're all from Mosul. They don't know Mosul, they don't want to be here, and they just want to leave. The best way to leave is to quickly destroy everything in front of them. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We're out of time. I want to thank all of our uh, panelists, Madam Rockman, Mr. Tafiori, and uh, Lori. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.
you very much. <laughs> أو شو أو شو رجع